All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here uh, to be speaking with the group. I love the uh, the Wild Ones mission, and uh, it's just just really great to to spend the morning with you. Uh, this talk right here, we will be focusing on nature based solutions, green infrastructure, and how to naturally manage stormwater. Uh, as mentioned, I consider myself a regenerative land care professional not an eco landscaper, not a landscape designer. Um, my belief is that to work with the land and that we need to restore mother nature's natural systems so that she can then take it from there, restore the balance that we have disrupted in certain areas uh, via our soil, our hydrology um, and our plant availability for our pollinators and just our wildlife in general. I mean, we focus a lot on pollinators and then when you read Doug Tallamy and everything, you're, you start thinking a whole lot about birds and bringing birds into the, into the mix. Um, and really it's all connected and it's all important. Um, but what we need to do is not just work in our silos that we need to regenerate these systems and focus on these systems. So the system we will be talking about today is going to be water and the fundamentals of green infrastructure. These are the, I will be introducing the five core methods um, for managing residential stormwater. Water is H2O, hydrogen two parts, oxygen one. But there is a third thing that makes it water and nobody knows what that is. I have been passionate about water for as long as I can remember. I used to drag my grandmother over to like the gullies on the side of the Kmart parking lot just to, to see the little pools over there. Um, I am, like I said, I am absolutely fascinated with water. And one of the, my favorite things about water is that it simultaneously is a part of our everyday routine while being a part of everything just magical and majestic in the world. So we get up, we shower, we make our tea or coffee, we bathe, we are literally bathed in water uh, every day. It's just a part of our existence. And at least for the most part in this country, and we are extremely fortunate, it is there on demand every time we want it. We turn the faucet, boom, there's our water. Um, so we go through much of our day without even thinking about water and how much of our life is involved with water. That being said, when you have the opportunity to stand on a beach and watch the breakers roll in, or if you're going on a hike and you come upon a stream or even a waterfall, you can't help but be swept away and just taken up in all just the magic and mystery of water and just the absolute beauty of water. And it's because that we are made up so much of water, I believe that we are just that connected to it. Over 50% of the water here on the planet was actually in existence before the planet Earth itself was even formed. So um, the other 50% came to Earth via asteroids, uh, and the like. And since then, no water, since the full creation of Earth, no water has really been created nor destroyed. It's just been recycled over and over again. Another fascinating piece about water that uh, has me so enamored is that when we hear about space, when we hear about a comet that comes around every 400 years, we hear about how that comet is made up of ice. When we hear about Pluto, we hear about Pluto and the ice. Well, what I love about that is I have ice in my freezer. I can actually relate to this. So water actually connects us you know, to the entire universe at large. And the universe is a very wet space. There are lots of water molecules out in space. It's not that if you were on a rocket ship, you'd need windshield wipers uh, because they are so spread out, but there are a lot of water molecules um, out there in space. And I just think it's so cool that um, areas of our of the Milky Way, areas of our universe that we have not even be, been able to visit yet, or like I said, comets that visit us every 400 years contain the same elements that we have here on Earth. As I mentioned, all the water here on Earth has just been recycled again and again and again. So every molecule of water has seen the inside of a tree, it has been inside of a cloud, every single molecule of water has seen the inside of a volcano. And it has also been inside of a dinosaur's kidneys. So like it or not, you shower and drink dinosaur pee every single day. But what I find even better than that, not that drinking dinosaur pee is great, but what's even cooler than that is 
a molecule of water in my glass right now could have been a mother's tear as she held their baby for the first time. It could have been a molecule of somebody's last breath. And it could have been a bead of sweat on a laborer as they built the pyramids. So not only does water connect us to the universe, but it connects us all through time, which again, is just, I find ex is extremely fascinating and has me so passionate about water. So what is the problem? Well, I think we're all starting to realize the problem. The problem is since the 80s, the number of extreme me meteorological events has doubled. And those of us um, here on, you know, in New England and from the, you know, from the mid-Atlantic on up, we are getting hit more and more with remnants of hurricanes. There's the hurricane season, we're starting to run through the alphabet um, more, than, more than ever. And uh, the storms are making their way further and further up the coast. And our storm events are getting more and more drastic. And we're starting to see those see and feel those repercussions. But what we need to focus on, and this is Boston just a couple of years ago, what we need to focus on is that we don't have a flooding problem. We see this on the news and they say, oh, there's severe flooding. Oh, they there's a flooding problem. Oh, this area is flooded. That area is flooded. Yes, those areas are flooded, but they don't have a flooding problem. They have an infiltration problem. And so if we can call it what it is, it's an infiltration problem, then we can focus on how to fix it. If we just call it a flooding problem, we do what we've been doing, and that is taking the water and sending it away. And we should all have realized long ago that there is no such thing as a way when you are a planet spinning out there in space all by yourself. It's just somewhere else. It's just moving the problem elsewhere. There is no way. So if we start focusing on infiltration, then we can find the answers. So still we find uh, situations like this. There are a number of towns up here in Massachusetts, and I know throughout that go into water bands regularly. Um, so water, you know, while we feel like we're getting more and more of it, it is still kind of a precious resource and something we need to hold on to. And we see this, there is a water main break in Boston probably once every three months. Now we go into these water bands, but part of the problem with a water ban is the aged infrastructure. So here is a water main break from 2019 and the water main that broke was from the 19th century. It was actually a wooden pipe from the 19th century. So what we've done is we created this water infrastructure, buried it and then just left it alone. And now it is aged and in serious need of updating because I'm pretty sure Boston's population has grown a little bit and the water demand has grown a little bit since the 19th century. We need to update this so bad, um, but it's going to cost billions and billions of dollars to bring it up. Arlington, Massachusetts, where I live, our water system is 80 years old. Uh, and I know the population has grown, has grown since then. So we have these water bands, but part of the, the problem and part of the reason for the water bands is because of our aged infrastructure. And we lose so much water through old and leaky pipes. We lose about a, a, a week's worth of water every month um, just through aged infrastructure. Now, on another level, there are things like this. This is an office park that I drove by almost for an entire summer and saw this every morning at about 4.30 in the morning. We need to take responsibility for our involvement with water. So I am sure somebody must have noticed that there was a giant puddle out there on this stretch of sidewalk every single morning. I'm sure, but they just, it never got handled. And if it never got noticed, shame on whosoever responsibility it was to notice that. So we really need to start taking responsibility for water because this was wasting hundreds of gallons per day. So it is my belief and it is, uh, it is a reality that everything we needed to know, we learned in our fifth grade class when we learned about the hydrologic cycle. Now, the way, let me just update you a little bit because for some of us, it's been a couple years since fifth grade. So, 
um, the way the hydrologic cycle is supposed to work is that when it rains, those raindrops get intercepted by trees. And those trees gently set the water down to the earth where it is allowed to infiltrate the earth. Now, in a, in a healthy watershed, that water after a rain event can take anywhere from a day to weeks to actually make its way to the lowest point where you will find our rivers and streams, which will then take it out to the ocean. And you can see here in this image, we have less than 1% surface runoff. We have 30% interflow. That's the, the penetration of the, of the groundwater. And then we have 40 to 50% evapotranspiration. Now that evapotranspiration lends itself to the reoccurring water cycle, what's called the short water cycle. It, it lends itself to the cooling and microclimates in our areas, reducing the heat island effect, et cetera. So that vegetation plays a huge key. So healthy soil, healthy vegetation, healthy hydraulic cycle, and everything is all good. But what we're looking at more is this. Now you'll see the surface runoff ups itself to 30%. So what's happening is our streams were built perfectly. Mother Nature built a perfect stream. She built a perfect river. However, when the water makes its way to the river in a matter of minutes and not days or weeks, those perfect rivers actually get overwhelmed and we get flooding because the water is making it there too fast. With reduced evapotranspiration, we have increased heating and the heat island effect. And with the severe compaction in our built environment, either in pervious surfaces or just compacted soils, we don't have that interflow and the groundwater, as we, as we know, has dropped significantly. So this is just a, a absolute perfect example. Like I said, when mother nature created rivers and streams, they, they were built in with a plan. There was a plan for what happens when we get a lot of rain. They had a flood plan all right there, but we decided that that was a little inconvenient for us. So we started messing with the system. However, mother nature was like, I built this a million years ago. So this is exactly where the flood plan is. And then we get our nose out of joint because you know we, we went ahead and built up, built up our societies on, on a modified, on modified waterways. Essentially, we've been mansplaining to Mother Earth for about 400 plus years. So the two main issues regarding stormwater and, rain, and rainwater in general are supply, uh, supply and demand and stormwater runoff. We'll just briefly touch on the uh, supply and demand and really, we are using essentially water at a rate and not replenishing it fast enough. It's not that there isn't enough water. There is a lot of water here on earth, um, but we are using it quicker and not replacing it uh, quick enough. Each year, at least 36 states are experiencing shortages and drought conditions. The average household, <clears throat> You, you know, of a 10,000 10, square foot lot is using 5,000 gal 5, gallons a week in landscape irrigation. And then each one of us uses 220 gallons in electricity per day. So for instance, I am all for um, trying to tackle some of the, the carbon emissions in the air with the invention of electric vehicles. I am absolutely all for that. However, electricity, to, to form electric, to the electric plants use a lot of water. So we're increasing our water consumption while trying to reduce CO2 in the air. So we have to really be careful on how we play these things because the production of electricity requires a lot of water in cooling, et cetera, not just in hydrologic power. But we are here today to talk about stormwater runoff. What difference does it make if the glass is half full or half empty, if the water is polluted. And this right here is the part where we take water for granted. So before we get going, I would like to just discuss um, or just get on the same page with what I mean when I'm talking about stormwater. So when I talk about stormwater, I'm talking about water originating from rainfall or snowmelt that runs across the land instead of infiltrating the ground. Along the way, it picks up pollutants as it runs across paved and unpaved areas. So when I say stormwater, this is what I'm talking about.
stormwater is the number one cause of coastal pollution. This we probably know, but it, it is good to actually just say it out loud so that we can, you know, so that it sinks in. This is a direct result of rainwater falling on highly developed surfaces, made up mostly of impervious surfaces, which do not allow the rain to permeate into the ground and recharge our aquifers. That recharge and that groundwater uh, is, is a huge player, I feel, in, in our global warming or in climate change. This right here is Arlington. So raindrops fall at 20 miles an hour. If you have a head like mine, you know that raindrops fall at 20 miles an hour. And then when they hit the ground, they pick up speed, especially in areas where we talked about with reduced vegetation to slow it down and set it down. And as water picks up speed, it can cause a lot of damage. And all of that damage ends up costing a lot of money. This right here is a snowbank in Boston in April. Now the snow is no longer there, but all that which was in the snowbank is still there. Now when April showers come, all of this will get washed into the waterway. So again, we need to be more thoughtful, more responsible, and we need to make those connections. So the stormwater impact of tomorrow, this is something that we have been talking about a lot. This right here is actually a bus called Boston 2050. This was a design contest held about eight years ago. Um, and it was, they, they challenged a bunch of architects and urban planners to come up with how we could develop Boston or design Boston to deal with sea level rise because Boston is one of the top 10 cities that are going to go under um, with sea level rise. So these are just designs and drawings that involve gondolas and oyster beds and all sorts of you know, commerce and modes of transportation for that sea level rise and to accommodate that sea level rise. This is something that we've talked a lot about. This is something that many of us think a lot about. However, there aren't any, there isn't anybody right now, there aren't people or companies or the like that can actually execute any of these ideas or designs. So we need to start making those connections and we need to start training a green infrastructure workforce and we need to start thinking and acting more on how to deal with stormwater instead of just thinking about it and talking about it. So what is the answer? Well, I feel that the answer is nature-based solutions, AKA green infrastructure. Green infrastructure is an approach to stormwater management that protects, restores, or mimics the natural water cycle. As a regenerative land care professional, I feel that by going back to what nature had originally intended and by mimicking those systems for the modern world or bridging the gap between the built environment and the natural world, we will find the answers that we need and we will find the answers um, and be able to solve the problems that we are facing. So what is green infrastructure? Stormwater management practices that protect, restore, and mimic native hydrologic conditions by providing the following function. Infiltration, like I said, we have an infiltration problem. Filtration, because the water in our, in our runoff is relatively dirty than any water that would be running off, they say, through the forest storage and this is key that we need to store um, water as much as possible and evaporation and transpiration and as i said these are ways that we can cool our cities these are ways that we can boost vegetation cre by creating microclimates and if you think about it um, with evaporation and transpiration, then water goes back up into the atmosphere. And then you have clouds. And when you have clouds, clouds ref reflect the UV rays. So by reflecting the UV rays, you cool the planet below. The environmental benefits of nature-based solutions, you have water quality treatment, you have flow control. So the water doesn't rush off and tear up the roads like you saw in that former picture. You're creating habitat, something that we were just talking earlier about, Talamy, and something that he talks a whole lot about. So creating the habitat, creating aesthetics, you know, especially in urban environments, making urban environments beautiful and people, you know, biophilia and the need to be around and be in green space is something that's been studied at nauseum, but is now finally starting to be put into practice. 
And then as I keep mentioning the cooling and the reduction of the heat island effect. So today I will be touching on what I believe are five core methods for green infrastructure. And that involves rain harvesting, permeable pavements, rain gardens, green roofs, and tree plantings. These are all uh, elements that I believe can be implemented on a residential scale in some way, shape or form. These are all elements that a typical landscape contractor, design build company, a landscape construction professional um, can help incorporate into their wheelhouse and, and begin to build for people. None of these things are extremely tricky. Um, they're not way out there and they're all very easy to implement in our existing footprints. So we'll start with rain harvesting. And in rain harvesting, I'm only going to touch on rain barrels and rain harvesting systems. But first we should talk about why we need to rain harvest in the first place. As I talked about life on this planet, we, we, we all know it. Uh, is all connected to water. Without water, we die. The EPA says that we use 165 gallons, and this does not include the 220 gallons that we use uh, in, elect in electricity consumption. Less than 1% of the Earth's water is available for use. The rest of it is currently locked up in the glaciers, and I, for one, hope that it stays there. So just to get an idea of rain, rainwater, and rainwater harvesting, one inch of rainwater, so in a one inch rain event, and that one inch rain event landing on one acre of land, that's 27,000 gallons of water. So um, depending on your property, if you have an acre, that's 27,000 gallons of water landing on your property. Uh, when I hear this figure, I think of things like mall parking lots, and I think of like, mall roofs, because mall parking lots are, you know, multiple acres, the roof, uh, the, you know, the square footage of the roofs of buildings like a, like a shopping mall, you know, is, an, uh, is over an acre in itself. So I'm thinking of all of that water, if you do the parking lot and the building itself, say you're talking five, six acres, you know, that's a lot of water that is running off and how we handle that water um, really needs to be considered. But that's big. An acre is big. I'm an urban person. I live on a postage stamp. And in my, in my business, I deal mostly with people who live on smaller lots. And we, hand, we work with those smaller lots, just under an acre uh, or so. So let's try to shrink this down a little bit. That same inch of water on a 2,000 square foot roof is 1,250 gallons. Now in New England, in our area, we've been receiving about 41 to 47 inches of rainfall a year. So if you pay for your water, that's a lot of money falling from the sky. And if you can capture some of that, um, that not only will save you money, but that will also keep that water from flowing into our storm drains. So let's just look at the math real quick. So you kind of know what I'm talking about. This isn't a test, there will be no quiz later, but it's just so you can understand and kind of have an idea on how to quickly calculate, um, maybe like you're calculating your roof uh, or your driveway and wanna know how much water is running off. What you're going to do is you are going to take the square footage of the area. And then you are going to multiply that by the inches of rain. Now, in this case, this equation, we're doing it for the amount of rain per year. Now, if you just put like two inches, you'll know how much is coming down in a two inch rain event. Then you're going to multiply that by 0.623. And this is the amount of water in gallons, one inch deep in one square foot. So you do all that out and you can essentially get a rough estimate of how much water is either coming off your roof, your driveway, a parking lot, your property, et cetera. Like I said, there's no test on the other end. So how can we use rainwater? Well, the low hanging fruit and the easiest is to use it for irrigation, for our lawns and flower beds. You can use it to wash your car. Now, we do not need potable water. We do not need our drinking water, which is what we are using to wash our car. You can use it to top off water features like pools and hot tubs. There's already chlorine and filters in there, so you could absolutely use rainwater for that. You know, If you go out west in certain areas of the world, 
you know, stored water would be very helpful uh, when we're talking about wildfires. And where I would like to get is being able to capture and reuse water for toilet and laundry. Because we do not need potable water again. We do not need drinking water in our toilets. In fact, in this country, our toilet water is cleaner than the majority of the Earth's drinks or the majority of the planet uh, drinks on, on a daily basis. So I think if we could save that water for drinking and then cooking and use our gray water and our storm water for toilets and laundry, that would be a huge leap. However, this gets tied up oftentimes, depending on your municipality or your community, this idea gets tied up a lot um, in red tape because there is money to be made on water coming and going. Where we're from, they charge you for the water that comes in and they charge you for the water that goes out. So if you're gonna disrupt that system, it makes people very unhappy. So let's start with rain barrels, the gateway drug to rain harvesting in general. I have a love-hate relationship with rain barrels. Just going to be straight up honest with it. I think rain barrels are great because they make you aware of how much water actually is coming off of your roof. They make you aware and they make, make you aware of water conservation uh, and thinking about storing rainwater, thinking about reusing rainwater, thinking about conserving water in general. Where rain barrels frustrate me, um, is that they only hold about 50 to 75 gallons of water. And um, they're not always, uh, it's not always efficient to get the water either out of the rain barrel or it's not always efficient. You know, if you have 400 gallons coming down your downspout and you only can capture 50 of it, rain barrels get overwhelmed sometimes an awful lot. Uh, when the rain barrels are some of the ones that you get for free from your municipality, people want to hide them. So they put them on like the most remote corner of either their garage or their house, which isn't necessarily near any of the plants that they want to be watering. So like I said, I sometimes get a little frustrated, but overall I do really love rain barrels. And they are getting better and better and they can be very pretty uh, like this reused whiskey barrel right here. So if you are a rain barrel person, and or if you are going to be getting a rain barrel, I highly suggest getting a downspout diverter. This solves part of the problem that I was talking about. When you have a downspout diverter, your downspout, when your rain barrel isn't there in the winter or when your rain barrel is full, your downspout will act as it's supposed to and act as a downspout. You can see in the, the very simple one in the middle, the idea is when it's open, all the water will spill into the rain barrel. When it's closed, all the water will go down the downspout. Uh, and that makes things very easy. You can see in this picture, um, that downspout is cut about three feet above the ground. So once that rain barrel is taken away for the winter, all that water is just gonna go splashing on the ground and it's going to be crazy and create big ice slicks and everything else. So by having a downspout diverter, um, it's, it definitely makes, the use of a rain barrel more efficient. Now up in the top right corner is just a kicked up version. This has a number of screens and filters that will take a lot of the larger debris out of the equation as the water comes down the downspout. This also has a smart sensor in it. So what it does is it allows the first flush or the first half inch or so to pass through. That first half inch has all the dust pollen and bird crap from your roof and it just allows that to flow out and then this what it is is a little sponge and as that sponge expands it begins to divert the water into the rain barrel so the water that is going into your rain barrel is minus all of that excess nutrients and debris so that's just the kicked up version uh, absolutely the other piece you can see in this picture is that rain barrels usually need to be up on uh, up on blocks or up on something so you can either get your um, watering can underneath them and to kind of create that, gr that gravity to let the rain barrel drain. Now there are sump pumps that you can throw into rain barrels to increase the PSI, which I appreciate. And there are certain, um, I don't know how efficient they are, but I've been made aware that there are certain pumps that you can put on the spigot of a rain barrel that will increase the pressure of the water coming out. Because if you've ever put a 25 foot hose 
on the end of a rain barrel, you know that it doesn't really, especially if you go uphill or anything, it's not really going to come out or it's just going to pee out the other end. So when a rain barrel is too small for you, then you can graduate to above ground tanks. So um, again, another thing I have a love-hate relationship with. Uh, these are not tanks that we installed. However, this is a, a client that I had um, and she had a thousand gallons of water on the side of her house in these tanks with a pump that would give it really household pressure. And she watered her entire landscape uh, from these tanks. So I think that was absolutely great. I really admired her efforts. Um, but one of the things she asked me to do was, can you mask my tanks? And if you think hiding an uh, air conditioning condenser is hard, trying to hide a thousand gallon tank on the side of somebody's house is very difficult. Now, some of these are very beautiful. And when they're built into the structures, they're absolutely very beautiful. Um, but sometimes they are just very difficult to hide. But this increased water capacity and the having a pump that increases the water pressure is great because then you have that thousand gallons. Below ground tanks is what I very much specialize in. And I'm just going to touch on below, below ground tanks and kind of the benefits there. So I like the below ground tanks because they are um, out of sight and you can just channel all that water to it. This just shows the many ways that a, a below ground tank could be used, especially if it was in a municipality that allowed you to use it for uh, toilets and laundry. But you can, all that water is available for landscape. You can usually capture a lot more water um, without having to find a footprint for it because it is underground. And so there are below ground tanks that are large cement cast tanks. There are preformed plastic uh, below ground tanks that you can add. Both of these are great because they are designed to be plumbed to different systems. However, depending on where you are in New England, you might run into a lot of ledge. And when you do that, you cannot necessarily excavate the hole required for the below ground tank, unless you do a modular system. Now, this is just an example of a modular system. Um, there are many of them out there, but I'd like to just walk you through this one. So you can see the water comes down the downspout and it enters a catch basin. This catch basin has a grid on top, like a plastic grid, that will eliminate the leaves and the twigs and the like that come down your downspout. Uh, inside is a 200 micron bag, which is going to eliminate the dust, the pollen and the fines that come down in that water. So relatively clean water is all making its way to your underground modular system. So then as we were talking, like with the rain barrel, what happens when the system fills and it becomes overwhelmed? Well, this runs out to a dry well. So I very much like this whole setup because the water is never wasted. Either the water is captured and used say in the landscape or for whatever reason it's going to be used for. And when that basin is full, if you have not used that water enough or like this year, if it rains the entire month of July, well then that water is just going to make its way into the ground where it will recharge the aquifers and the groundwater in general. So this is really what that looks like. The void space for the water is created by these blocks and they go by a number of names, aqua blocks, eco blocks, matrix blocks and the like. Each one of these blocks creates 27 gallons or so of void space. Now, why did, when we are talking about the ledge and everything else, why do I like this? I like this because you can create a basin to whatever size, depth, or in even shape that you would like. So for instance, if I need to go say six feet deep to create the basin I want and I hit ledge at three feet, well, then I can just make, make a wider basin. Uh, for this, I've had to create in a very narrow area. We did a thousand gallon system and it was just like a long underground trench um, because we, could, we couldn't really go wide with it. We just had to go long with it. So it's great because it allows you the options um, to, to size and shape that, that catch basin. So you're still catching that same thousand, two thousand, five thousand gallons of water. Um, it just doesn't have to be a buried tank. 
The downfall to this system and systems like this is they don't plumb as easily, um, say, to a house or, or the like. Oftentimes, when I install a system like this, we plumb the whole thing to a spigot, and then that spigot is used for uh, irrigation. The other great thing about this is uh, you have an option for, a, uh, for something like this. So this client here wanted to put in a 1500 gallon system so that they would have water available um, when their town went into a water ban because they had extensive gardens. They also wanted a water feature so that they could attract wildlife. So what we did was built that tank like you just saw out of all those blocks and then we installed a separate pump and everything so that this fountain could use that captured rainwater, recirculate it and create a water feature within their garden using that water and then it just drains down the side and runs back into the system. However, here it's the birds come and they perch on the side of the of the urn itself and they splash and drink from that water and then the pollinators and uh, all all other insects feed off the or drink off the moisture that's on the rocks below. So this was a client they were very much into their plants and very much into their wildlife. So this was a way that they could capture water, save water in addition by adding and while adding a water feature that is going to supply for wildlife in the area. So that was a very cool project, a very cool scenario um, that we were able to work out using that system. So then the next of the core methods are permeable pavements. This is also something or an area or a method that um, I have lots of experience installing. Now, um, the key with permeable pavements is all in the base, it's all about the base. Um, and you will see that. So that is the one thing. And the base itself is made from different grades of gravel. So, and you, that is the one thing that all of these methods that you are going to see has in common. So normally in digging a base for a permeable pavement, you are going to have one and a half inch crushed gravel. And then on top of that, you'll have three quarter inch cru crushed gravel. And then normally on top of that, you'll have about a three eighths inch crushed gravel. What you never have with permeable pavements, and this is something that I have fixed a lot in failed systems, is you never have sand, you never have stone dust, you never have perk pack, all of these typical paving materials that have been used cannot be used with permeable pavements. And this is key because a lot of landscape companies that come along and do a permeable pavement installation feel that they've installed the pavers or the like for 20, 30 years and they know exactly what they're doing. The material or the paver say in this picture is the same. The process is different. Never sand, never stone dust, never perk pack. So let's go into pavers. I mean, this is what we're looking at, you know, right here, these different grades of gravel. This is the surface piece so that um, on the left side is 3 8 crushed gravel that if this was a paver installation is in place of the sand or the stone dust. So we have the three quarter gravel, then we have the 3 8 So the pavers and when installing pavers, the paver itself, the brick, the paver itself is not permeable. What makes it permeable is the joint. So they, these have exaggerated joints that allow the water to pass through into the, all that gravel down below, which provides the storage. So then here, in lieu of sand and stone dust, what we are using is a fine crushed stone, which remains open. So it's you have the 3 8 in the bedding layer, and then what's called the number nine stone that you put in the joints, which allows all that water to pass through, uh, which is great because you're, where you're working with gravel and the stone and the like. These are very much resistant to all the weeds. If you start getting weeds in your permeable pavement installation or paver installation, it's because too many of the fines have made its way in there. Now, permeable pavements are great in this area because you have less icing. 
Um, because in during that freeze thaw cycle and the thaw during the day, all that water just makes its way through through the joints. So you don't have that puddling. So in the winter, there's less ice. Also, because of all the gravel underneath, water is not held beneath the surface of the pavements. So you don't have the frost heaps. So permeable applications are actually great here in the Northeast because we have that freeze thaw cycle. So you won't have the frost heaps and you won't have the icing. So there are many other different pavements other than pavers that uh, can be applied. One is pervious concrete. So um, pervious concrete can either be laid in place or it can be um, purchased in large blocks like you see here. So you'll hear pervious concrete and you'll hear pervious asphalt. Both of these are the same product minus the fines. So they take all the dust and all the fines out of that and it is just really the aggregate and whatever the adhesive is um, for concrete or asphalt. So concrete, if poured in place, uh, isn't always as practical because it's missing the fines. It takes longer to cure. So if you were to pour a sidewalk where it could cure in say 24, 48 hours, it's going to take probably 72 plus um, for that sidewalk to cure, which is why using large pre-poured uh, pre and pre-cured uh, slabs are great. But these are wonderful because they allow all that water to pass through. So it's great for a sidewalk application because you're getting water, say, to the street trees, which normally don't get to see much water. Um, and, and it's all uh, ADA compliant as well. So it performs and functions just like it's just like the natural product, concrete or cement. Um, but it has the enhanced capability of water infiltration. So these grid systems, you may or may not have seen, these are excellent for uh, alternative roadways, overflow parking, uh, and the like, because these grid systems, uh, what they do and what they're designed to do is, that, well, they allow water to pass through, but you can fill either the cups in the plastic or the joints in this concrete version um, with, you can fill it with compost and seed, whether grass seed or clover seed, uh, or you can fill it with gravel. Either way, the water is allowed to pass through the system. The way we install these most often, again, is for say overflow parking. Um, say it's a, a household where the, the kids are gone most of the time, but they come home for the summer from college and there's not enough room in the driveway to have one or two extra cars. So what we do is we essentially build these systems into the lawn so that you can drive on the lawn without compacting the soil and ruining the grass. We do these as access roads um, for either uh, fire, fire trucks or um, parks management, et cetera, for an area where you need to drive through, not all the time, um, but that you need, to, you need to drive through and it needs to support a vehicle. Um, so that's where these systems, <clears throat> excuse me, are great because you don't end up compacting the soil beneath, which then destroys the hydrology of the site. And then finally, there are many alternatives out there. This one is called porous pave. This is a asphalt alternative made from recycled tires and aggregate held together with a urethane binder. Um, this is great for walking paths. Uh, and you, as you can see, it, it was applied as a, a tree pit alternative. Um, so this is, there are just many applications and there are many products out there um, that are, that will allow the infiltration of water and facilitate the natural hydrology of an area. So then we will move on to the next method, which is rain gardens. Now you probably all of you have heard about rain gardens. Many of you just like rain barrels probably have a rain garden or would like a rain garden. Oftentimes people um, I have found are hesitant on rain gardens because they're called rain gardens. And it sounds like it's tricky. Rain gardens are real simple. Rain gardens are perennial beds that have the added benefit of capturing rainwater and infiltrating it. 
you will hear when you're talking, oftentimes you hear people talk about rain gardens and people talk about bioswales or bioretention cells. Usually on a municipal level, you might hear the talk of bioswales or bioretention cells. They're essentially the same thing. A rain garden, however, is more for like a single family residence. Um, and more often than not, you are just working with the native soils in the area where a bioswale will have an overflow, an underdrain, it, and usually has engineered soils. So it's designed to capture a certain amount of water and it's designed to infiltrate that water at a certain rate. And that water then has a destination beyond just going into the ground. There's either an overflow or an underdrain that will move some of that excess water around after it's been filtered. The five rules to planning a rain garden, and this just shows you how simple it is. Must be 10 feet from the house. You do not want to infiltrate a whole lot of water, whether it be 75 gallons or 175 gallons, uh, near your foundation. So definitely take it 10 feet away from the house. It must drain within 24 hours. So the best thing you can do is to dig a test hole. And I suggest filling that test hole uh, with water allow it to drain, then fill it again. If that water stands for 24 hours or even 12 hours, you may want to reconsider a, if a rain garden is a good solution for you. If that water drains away, that's perfect. In 36 hours, mosquitoes can start breeding. So you need it to drain with uh, under 24 hours. You never ever put a rain garden in an existing wet area of the property. I get asked this all the time. People are like, oh, water collects down here. Can I just put a rain garden here? That's not a rain garden, that's a pond. So if you have ponding and you plant it up, you're just really creating a vegetated pond. The idea of the rain garden is to infiltrate that water. So by installation of a rain garden, you might be able to dry out that wet area on your property. What you would do is you would install the rain garden upslope and allow it to capture the runoff from the driveway or the runoff from the downspout and infiltrate it upslope so it doesn't keep running downhill and saturate the lowest part of your property. Do not use wetland plants in a rain garden. Oftentimes people think, oh, it's gonna capture water. I need to have all these things like cattails and pickerel rush and no. You want to plant your rain garden. If you go online and if you look at things, it can start sounding really complicated. There are different zones to a rain garden, et cetera, et cetera. I always encourage people just plant the, with all using your favorite perennials. For the most part, that is always going to work because even sedum can be inundated with water for about 24 hours and live just fine as long as that water drains away afterwards. So most any perennial can take uh, saturated soils for a, a bit of time. Uh, if you have a slow draining rain garden, or if you really are trying to capture a lot of water, then yes, you need to really focus on plants that can handle wet feet um, more than just being dry. But the reality of, the, of a rain garden is it's dry more than it's wet. So you'll go through an entire, normally, except this past summer, normally you'll go the entire summer or the entire fall and that rain garden is gonna be dry, which is why you don't plant it with wetland plants. You want drought tolerant plants actually. And then plan for triple impact. You know, so the beauty of a rain garden, now you've created a perennial bed. Let's just say your perennial bed is a pollinator garden. So now you have a pollinator garden, that's awesome because now we're, now we're helping out the pollinators, feeding the pollinators and working with the wildlife. That's great because it's a rain garden as well. So it's like multiple benefits here. Not only are we capturing and infiltrating rainwater, but now it's also our pollinator garden, which is great for the wildlife. So just plan to make as much impact as possible when you are designing and planning your rain garden. Now, Yukon, you may or may not know, but Yukon has created an app that allows you to go on there. And uh, I know it's for Apple, I believe it's for Android, but you can go on there and you can put in your square footage and you can size your rain garden perfectly uh, and the like. And there are many tutorial videos uh, available as well. So here is just an example of a rain garden that we built. What was happening is um, just to the left of the picture and those stepping stones is the base of the driveway. So the water was running down the driveway and pooling in front of the garage with nowhere to go. So we just changed the contour of the land a little bit so that the water would then drain off 
It comes through this gravel area. It makes its way through the carex there in the front in the forebay and just begins to saturate the soils in the back, which is this is just a, um, a basin that we that we carved into the land. A typical rain garden is only six inches at its deepest point. It's just a slightly depressed, not sad, perennial bed. This right here is a rehabbed rain garden. Uh, we did, we worked with a youth group, Youth Build Boston, and we worked rehabbing five rain gardens uh, for the Boston Parks Department around the city of Boston. So this is a walking path that sees a ton, a ton of water uh, when it rains because there's nowhere for it to go. Um, so we worked on this large, rehabbing this large area. Here is another one in Boston that we worked on. You can see in that clear gravel area that takes all the runoff from the street and the surrounding uh, one of the surrounding buildings. It channels it through this area where it's then absorbed and taken up by uh, seasonal planting. So as the plantings kind of hit their stride, we have things that come up in the spring and things that are coming into full stride in the fall. And that's when they're really going to be drinking the most. So moving on from rain gardens and bioswales, we get into green roof systems. So green roofs are desired by almost everybody, but not everybody can have them. And so I will explain to you kind of the whole thing behind green roofs. The green roof setup itself is very basic. You have a root barrier, which keeps the, the, plant, the roots from the plants from messing with the structure itself. There is a drain mat, which allows the water to pass through down to the root barrier and then run off. You have the water retention, should you wanna hold some more water there. You have the growing medium and you have the vegetation. So the, the, the steps and the elements of a green roof are very simple. The first thing you need to consider when you're considering a green roof is can my structure hold it? So. On at least a couple of times a season, somebody says, I would like you to put a green roof on my shed. I say, okay, we need to get a structural engineer to look at your shed to tell me how much weight your shed can take. And they're like, I'm not gonna pay for a structural engineer. That's ridiculous. And then I say, I'm not gonna put a green roof on your shed and then have it collapse in the winter on top of your motorcycle. And then you're gonna be mad at me. So um, the first thing you need to do is find out is your structure structurally sound and how much weight can you add to it. Uh, you need to figure about 60 pounds of snow, snow load. So how much beyond that can it hold? So this project right here was the roof of a garage. They called and said, we'd like to put a green roof on our garage. And I said, great, you need a structural engineer. They got the structural engineer. The structural engineer told me how much weight we could put on the garage. Then I said, perfect. The next thing you need to do is get a roofer or find a way, find somebody who can certify that the roof itself um, is watertight and that the integrity is there. So green roofs out of all these systems that we've talked about, um, you know, definitely are a little more involved. However, they are great. For instance, this client wanted to have their, the roof of their garage blend in with the surroundings. They have a uh, Frank Lloyd Wright-esque home nestled into the woods that's surrounded by um, low bush blueberry, bearberry and the like. And that's exactly what we planted on the roof here. So it just blends in uh, with all of its surroundings. <laughs> um, and as, as it just matted out, it was great. And you could look out over it um, and, Same in, and just kind of see what's going on. This right here is a project, a green roof project uh, that we worked with another youth group and we put green roofs on bus shelters around Boston. Now, the purpose of this was to show the city of Boston that you did not have to spend millions and millions of dollars to have an impact and also to show and prove that small amounts of green infrastructure can add up to a lot. So the idea here was if we were to put green roofs on all of the bus shelters in Boston, that would e equal about an acre, which would take 27,000 gallons that we talked about out of the, the aged stormwater system, uh, drain systems that Boston is seeing. This would also help create wildlife pathways through the city. Also, it would help cool the area while beautifying 
the urban the urban surroundings. So there was just benefit after benefit after benefit to this program. Uh, we ran this as a pilot project. We put up 15 shelters. They are no longer there. Um, we were asked to take them down once the, the grant money and the pilot ran out. Um, but this is an idea that I absolutely stand by because it's it took about at the time when we put these up, it was about $5,000 a shelter. So we, we could have put a lot of shelters up. And while we were putting these shelters up, we were teaching people how to install and maintain them. So we were creating the maintenance workforce needed to uh, maintain these shelters uh, throughout the year. So this is an idea that I absolutely stick by. And I think we need to think of when we're thinking about climate change and when we're thinking about um, these large problems, I think we need to find ways that we can break it down and have an impact on a small manageable level. And that can start by just each one of us making sure that we keep all of our stormwater on our property. If each one of us uh, was responsible for our own runoff and made sure that it did not run off, we would reduce many of the flooding problems, issues, infiltration problems we're having throughout our cities and on our streets. And finally, trees. Trees are the least expensive and one of the most effective ways that we can manage stormwater. As I mentioned before, trees capture that, that raindrop falling at 20 miles an hour and gently sets it to the ground where it either can be reabsorbed or if it's a street tree and it gently sets it to the ground, it's setting it to the ground um, without the velocity so it won't be tearing up the pavement like you saw before. 25% of atmospheric carbon is captured by trees. We need to focus on our tree plantings. As municipalities, I talked, I was just recently, uh, a, a month ago, in a conversation with a municipality who was like, we're gonna put in 500 trees. I said, how about you put in 250 properly? Because dropping these street trees into these little tree coffins and areas on our sidewalks without the proper soil volume, uh, the tree has about a five year, five to eight year lifespan. Trees don't really start kicking in until they actually ac accumulate some age and some size. And that's when they really start providing the cooling that we need. That's when they provide the carbon sequestration we need. And that's when they have that surface area to offset large storms and large, and large uh, um, quantities of water uh, as it comes down. So really tree planting, not only is Doug Tallamy right, by planting all these trees, especially oaks, can we boost our wildlife and, and our in the habitats around us, but it's also one of our best ways to mitigate stormwater runoff um, and the like. So it is the cheapest, easiest, and probably one of the most aesthetically pleasing um, versions of green infrastructure. So that right there, does conclude this presentation. I am hoping you have a ton of questions for me because as you can see, I really love to talk about stormwater and ways to, uh, to install nature-based solutions. So thank you all very much for your time and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Trevor. I do believe we have some questions in the chat. So let me just get to the top and um, I'll read them off to you from there. Okay, so first question is going back to uh, pervious pavements, especially the concrete and asphalt uh, versions. How durable are they compared to the conventional counterparts? Um, the, the current iterations of all of these are just about there. Um, pervious concrete and pervious asphalt are great for driveway and parking lot or low speed installations. The, um, none of these installations can necessarily stand up to high speed traffic. Um, so they are good for low speed and they all do require maintenance, um, just a different kind of maintenance. You need to make sure that the, the pore space within any pervious uh, installation remains open and so it remains pervious. Uh, so for instance, a parking lot, you would not use sand during the winter on that parking lot 
And then in the spring, you would need to essentially vacuum the parking lot to make sure that the poor space remained open. So um, while some look at that as creating a high maintenance parking lot, when you think about it, you know, our driveways and the like with the frost heaves and the cracks and the, you know, everything going on, um, they are, they themselves are pretty high maintenance. Um, it's just different. One is a little bit of maintenance annually. And the other is I need to tear it up every 15 or so years and start again, depending on how quickly, uh, that deteriorates. One of the, uh, other pieces that I get asked about, so I'll just say it now, um, People talk about, you know, what about my gravel driveway or what about my crushed shell driveway? Uh, unless they are installed with the intent of having a basin, a gravel basin below, those are only semi-pervious, just like turf, turf grass. Our lawns are only semi-pervious um, because the soil gets compacted underneath a gravel driveway. So it does not just allow water to just go zipping right through. Uh, there is a, an amount of runoff. Same with lawns, people assume I have a lawn, it's permeable, it's only semi-pervious. A um, lot of water runs off of lawns and that's how we get a lot of that excess nutrients uh, in our storm drains um, because it's running off the lawn and making its way to the storm drains. Uh, Trevor, this is Suzanne Thompson. Let me also uh, piggyback on a related question. You said the pervious, you couldn't use sand in the winter what about using any kind of snow melt or anything? Are there more or less cautions of that? Is it gonna break down quicker? Um, so if you are going to use a, an ice melt, you will want to use one, especially if you're using it on uh, concrete pavers or concrete, you're going to wanna use one that is concrete friendly because um, nothing, you know, that definitely breaks down uh, concrete quickly. Uh, a lot like the rock salt does. So you need to use a concrete friendly uh, ice melt. And uh, you also, like, as I said, though, you don't have as much icing in general. So you don't need to use that much. So like where I was talking about, you need to say vacuum out these pores. Well, you're going to save, let's just say you're a, you know, a, a school and, you, and you're doing this in the parking lots. You're going to save on your ice melt you know, so you're going to be able to afford more the, the VAC process. Okay, great. So, and it sounds like uh, one thing we can conclude from that answer, Trevor, is that these materials could be suitable for residential driveways in addition to the sort of block pavers you talked about as a, you know, essentially the top layer because they are low speed you know, not heavily used as highways or roadways. Absolutely, and they'll last longer yeah. than, than asphalt. Okay, that's, um, that's great to know. Okay, then people were asking about um, costs, you know, upfront costs. How much do the installed rainwater tank systems cost to install? And are there do-it-yourself options somewhere in between a rain barrel on the building corner and a buried tank system with pumps? Are there other intermediate options? And I realize this will depend very much on, you know, other aspects of the site in, under consideration. But could you, you know, maybe address that a bit? Absolutely. So a rain harvesting system goes in on average at about four to five dollars a gallon. So a thousand gallon system is going to cost you about four thousand um, dollars. It all depends on where on the property it is. There's a lot of, but the majority of systems I install go in for about four to five dollars a, a gallon. Um, when that all happens, pervious systems, the permeable pavements like the pavers, usually go in at around uh, I would say thirty five to forty two dollars a square foot installed. Um, depends on the paver. If you're just using a standard brick-esque, that's going to be on the lower side. If you want something really decorative, that will be on the higher side. They're a little bit more expensive because you have to dig the basin, um, which is going to be deeper. So you have to excavate more and you have to bring in more gravel. So the system to install to create that storage area does bump the cost up. So the pavers themselves, like brick to brick, is about the same price, but there's more involved with the excavation and creating the storage um, et cetera. So like I said, that's usually runs, I've found between 35 and $42 or so uh, installed cost. 
Uh, so like I said, five dollars for the rain harvesting, about say thirty-eight dollars. We'll kind of split it in the middle um, for a permeable paver or most of the permeable pavements. Um, I've found that the the pervious concrete. This all depends. If you're using the pre-poured, it'll be usually a lot less expensive um, to run to create. Like if you call up an asphalt company or a concrete company. Uh, some of them will supply this service, but it, what makes it cost a lot is they have to stop what they're doing, clean out all the fines from their system and make you a special batch. So if the square footage isn't, doesn't, you know, might not justify, you know, stopping and washing everything and creating a special batch. So if you can find a company that does the pre-pour or until companies come online that can regularly make this without stopping production in general, um, the costs of the, of the initial costs on this will be a little bit higher. But like I said, what you save uh, in the longevity of the product, uh, pro uh, the product over time uh, definitely makes up for it. Okay, um, I just have a follow up question to that, Trevor, which is, um, I don't know if this is kosher or not, but I think because this is not yet mainstream, do you have um, a list of, I guess, contractors or people that you work with that you could recommend to folks if they are interested in these kinds of services? Because I know for myself, at least several years ago, that was one of the challenges is, you know, kind of even finding, let alone evaluating, you know, potential contractors to do this kind of work. Yes, absolutely. So part of what I do uh, is train now. I've done this for 20 years, and now what I am doing is I am training and empowering contractors to do this right, because the more times that these things go in improperly, the less people are going to want to have them. So we need to have these systems go in properly. Uh, so I do have a, a good list of people, um, at least on the East Coast, that can uh, that can help with many pro uh, projects. The other part of that question that I forgot to answer is: Is there a somewhere in between a rain barrel, and that would probably be an above ground tank? Um, and it really just depends. The underground tanks aren't really that hard. The hardest part of the underground tanks is figuring out what you are going to do with the excavated soils. Ultimately, these things uh, when they go in. The only working part on it is the pump. Everything else is gravity fed. You connect your downspouts to the catch basins to a pipe that just drains in. Real simple, once that's in, it's not gonna break, it's not going anywhere. So the only thing that can actually break or you know, happen with it and is, the, uh, is the pump itself. Uh, and if you are handy at all, um, it's real simple to, to put in. And I believe it is rainharvesting.com. I believe they have a lot of um, tutorials and, and products to help do it yourselfers, uh, put stuff in and you can figure out and get yourself a nice little kit. And, you know, again, if you either rent an excavator or have a, a strong back, you can absolutely make it happen. Uh, Trevor, let's also group these permeable pavement questions together. One just came in. Is permeable pavement systems, are they less effective in areas that have lots of ledge or in areas that are flood zones? Um, no. So if there's lots of ledge, you may not be able to, uh, I mean, if you can, if you can, so a, an average excavation, say for a driveway, is probably gonna be about say 12 inches deep. The average excavation for a permeable driveway um, would probably be 14 to 16 is what I do, um, which is a little a little more, but I also size, I base, I base it all on how, what runoff are we catching. If you can get 12 inches deep and then you're hitting ledge, you will probably still be okay uh, because you are passing that water down below the surface. So you won't have the freeze thaw uh, and the water will either make its way through the ledge or whatever it happens underneath. With a high water table, um, I've actually installed this. I have a couple projects that went in in high water tables and it actually allows, allows you to keep from uh, disrupting the hydrology because let's just say the water comes up, it's gonna come up through the ground and it'll come up through the pavers and then retreat back down through the pavers or the pavement itself. So, um, that it that it's actually not a bad thing to have in an area with a high water table 
Um, and depending on the ledge, it shouldn't be a it shouldn't be a bad thing either. Okay, and I think we you've addressed is there a permeable pavement that would be good for a home driveway? Did did we think like you answered all of that? Yeah, yeah. But I, any of any of the ones that we talked about, I would I would recommend either the the pre poured concrete or uh, a permeable paver. Um, they, you know, though both of those will stand up over time really well uh, and 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 work out really well. Now, one of the th another question that I often get is, I have a really long driveway and I can't afford to do all of that but I do have a water problem. So what you can do in that situation is uh, create sections in your driveway. For instance, like if you created a cobble apron or something that would allow some of the water at the head of the driveway, whether your driveway slants down to that or back the other way. And then every say 10 to 15 feet, if you created a three to four foot permeable strip that would inter intercept the water as it goes down, then you don't have the entirety of the water making it to the base or out onto the street, whichever way your driveway is pitched. Uh, from there, as it makes its way into those channels, you could then have a pipe or something in there that would run that water out to a rain garden that goes down the side of your driveway or the like. So the water is then just moved out from the uh, the driveway itself, but you don't necessarily. Again, it's all about breaking the issue as you know as small as possible and making it digestible. I mean, if you have a hundred seventy foot driveway or a hundred foot driveway, you may not be able to do it all in pavers. But if you break it up, you can reduce the amount of runoff from your driveway. Great. I think there's one more question embedded here that relates to the permeable, or, or actually, this um, is the um, installed, um, I guess, in ground systems is. Why is so much space used up by the aqua blocks? Is it for structural integrity of the basin? I don't fully understand the question. The space for the blocks. Uh, so these created... were the underground tanks, I think you were talking about, and those blocks that line the sides of the tanks. Correct. They, it creates the void space for the water storage. So like I said, like each one of those blocks, you say you dig a... 10 by 10 by six foot deep um, excavation, then you fill that entire thing with those blocks and you are going to, you've now created about say 1500 gallons of void space to hold that water. Huh. So you can reduce it, you can make it small, you could make it 200 gallons or whatever. Um, and that would be a much smaller excavation, but the size of the excavation depends on how much water you are looking to hold. Okay, I think so it is, I think the answer to that person's question is yes, it's not a, the basin is not an open space. It's filled with these struts that are created by the blocks and that makes it strong so it won't collapse. C correct, yes, the blocks fill in the, it's not a, it's not a, it's, when it's complete, it's not an open hole. It's it's filled with the blocks and the blocks are hollow. Like I said, each one creates about 27 gallons of void space. So you you build it off of that. You know, you, your excavation and the amount of blocks you put in it are all based on how much water you're looking to capture. Okay, so Heather, I hope that answers your question. Okay, we had several questions about green roofs. So I think that was I the last paver question I saw. Um, so we, as I say, green roof questions. Does a green, green roof have to be flat or can it have a shallow pitch? What's kind of the, you know, how, how, so if it can have a pitch, what's the most pitch in your experience that works or is there other aspects to how you design it? Um, so it, a, a green roof can have a pitch. Um, the gentler, the pitch, I mean, there are systems for every pitch. Flat is best. Uh, a gentle pitch is fine. Eventually, what you end up doing, um, essentially, and this is this has been done a couple of times, is you create a, a a block and rail system. So where you end up kind of creating um, trays, say for the the green roof itself, and those are connected to a rail when you're dealing with a with a steep pitch. Uh, so you're it's almost like creating a, a green wall, a living wall because you're creating these, these tray systems that will then lock onto the roof uh, so they don't come sliding down. 
So it's um, like the kerosene. Thing, yeah. Okay. So with the, um, you know, so a gentle pitch is absolutely fine, but gravity usually does begin to slide things. So you just need to construct a little differently um, when you're when you're working with a with a pitch. But I've done it. it you know, it's, it can be done. I usually avoid anything that has a severe pitch, um, just because it's it's more engineering than I want to get into. Okay, and then uh, Marsha wants to know, how do you weed a green roof? <laughs> do you need to weed a green roof? <laughs> I guess that depends on your threshold of beauty. Um, so like the bus shelters were real easy. You just put a ladder down, got up there and pulled any weeds that came off. Um, you do essentially need to weed a green roof because seeds blow in and they take hold and you certainly do not want a tree growing out of your, you know, your green roof unless it's designed for that. Um, so you just need to get up there and pull out any unwanted vegetation. Okay, and then um, another member wants to know why didn't Boston maintain or expand the green roofs um, that you had already installed? Uh, this is, <laughs> oh, it, it was a great project and I've actually had people call me really from all over the world um, to find out about the project and how they can replicate it in their area. So the deal in Boston is the T, Boston Public Transportation, owns half the bus shelters, and the city of Boston owns about the other half. The half that the city of Boston owns are actually maintained uh, by a third party company. So that third party company passed the pilot, really wanted nothing to do with this. They saw the green roof cutting into advertising dollars because then they couldn't put any ads on top of it, uh, and they did not want to have uh, people outside of their staff maintaining the bus shelter. They said they had a whole list of excuses. The T uh, really did want, and they were actually going to give us money to um, do some more shelters. They loved the idea. However, the maintenance was going to be totally at our cost. Um, and the T wanted nothing to do with it once it was up and they wanted to have the right to have us take them all down within a 24 hour period, should they choose. So that was not a sustainable program. The idea was to put these up, to put them up using entry level workers who would then be trained to install and maintain them over the years. And that this would be a, a long time ongoing sustainable program that would have been built into the budget. Um, so to just dump it all onto our lap and to say, hey, you know, you have 24 hours to take them down at our discretion was just not a sustainable method. So we had to just, you know, scrap the whole thing. But we were able to, to take down um, temperature data and, and the like. We were able to cost it out and take a bunch of metrics. We took uh, runoff, stormwater runoff uh, data. So this, I mean, it's all, it's all been done and, you know, it, it's ready to go when anybody is ever ready to make it happen. Well, that's a shame, but I'm glad that it actually served you well as a demo project. Okay, some more questions. Um, related sort of more generally to all the systems you talk about, um, with an eye to the future, due to climate change, when you design today for maximum runoff during extreme events, do you actually design for the future, meaning for greater runoff than what we're receiving today, two, three, four inches of rainfall over a certain period of time? Um, you know, what's, what's your approach to that and what have so you the, been able to convince people to do? <laughs> so the, um, the short answer is yes, I design, I always over-engineer, which is why, like, if you look up the specs for permeable pavements, you're not going to see 16 inches. Um, I over-engineer because our storms are, are increasing. Like I said, we're getting hit with all these hurricane remnants. Now, the systems I put in 15 years ago which I actually visited over July because we got rain all of July. Uh, I stopped by a couple of those systems and they were definitely maxed out because I did not think that we were gonna be getting like four inches of rain followed by another two days of rain. Um, you know, So they were definitely maxed out. Now, since then, um, for say like the past 10 years, I have been planning uh, further and further into the future. Uh, my, my view now is, uh, is, is, is to capture a whole lot more water 
than it ever was. So, so it comes down to, um, I design a system for uh, an ex extreme events, kind of what we've been doing, say a 50 year storm or plus, I'd like to say I could design always for a hundred year storm, but most people's budgets can't really handle that. So what I do is I design for say that 50 year storm and then build in uh, overflows and the like so that the excess water can be uh, gently and responsibly uh, moved either across the property at, or allowed to infiltrate elsewhere. It's made me get creative because I want to give people the solutions, but I need to give you the solution uh, you know, on your budget. And aside from like a green roof or a rain garden, you know, the, the driveway and the like it's, it's, or, you know, a, a, dr a dry well or any of that, it's really not that sexy. It's so it's like, you know, you have to, you have to make it all worthwhile. Sure. I guess practical considerations always are part of the equation. All right. What species of trees are best to plant near sidewalks and driveways for shade and seasonal interest? taking into account leaf and seed drop, roots infiltrating plumbing, et cetera. Do you have some guidance or maybe there are, I don't know if Maggie Redfern's still on the line, you can give your answer, Trevor, and then Maggie may have some thoughts or some of our other members who can chime in. Um, so absolutely, I choose my trees. So every, every municipality has its list and I'm kind of over the list. I would, I'm trying to introduce more natives, of course, um, but you really do need to choose, uh, I, I would say, according to the, the area and the situation. And people on here may, like, may disagree with me, but you, there are some, sometimes you have a calling for, say, like an oak or a maple, um, and then other times, you know, not so much. So, I, I, like I said, I try to work in native trees, but it really, in my mind, it's all situational. And it really starts with the soil volume because it doesn't make any sense to put in uh, a tree that's going to get, you know, uh, say, you know, like a sycamore, like an oak, like anything that's going to get 60 something feet high if you don't have the soil volume to support a tree like that. So uh, again, it's really, I, I first start with the soil and I say, okay, how much soil volume do I have? Is this tree going to get enough water? Is it going, can it reach its maturity in this situation? And then depending on that really guides my choice of the tree rather than just firing as many trees as possible into the ground. Okay, um, Maggie or anybody else, does anybody else want to um, speak to this topic? I'll, I'll unmute uh, just quickly. Um, the question almost asks for the perfect tree and all trees are perfect, but the situations change greatly. Um, I just dropped in the chat a link to the, the list of native trees that um, New London Trees, a group I'm involved with here, um, has come up with and we've organized it by small, medium and large trees. And I think depending on the situation, um, you can look at this list and, and hopefully uh, find something that will work for you. Um, we don't include all native trees here um, and it's, it's definitely geared more towards um, deciduous trees than um, evergreen trees, um, just because usually for um, sidewalk and, and street situations, um, that is uh, what's, what's preferred. In the wintertime, we don't usually plant evergreens um, just because they, they create uh, cold and um, icy, icy patches within our streetscape. So ch check out the, the link in the, uh, in the chat. Thanks. Great. Thank, Thank you, you. Meg. Sorry, did I? didn't mean to talk on top of you, Trevor. No, um, you're absolutely fine. I said thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, does the University of New Hampshire still have demonstration projects and research on permeable pavements? And I assume she means online as kind of a resource. Um, I'm wondering if you're aware of that. Um, I know you did give us one reference to this rainharvesting.com website. Yeah, U UNH has got a, a lot of great uh, information. They have uh, examples of permeable pavements. They've been testing them out. They have one of my, I would say one of my favorite, um, I'll call it municipal, it's designed for municipalities, but soil mixes 
um, when you're creating, when I'm creating bioswales, like every municipality has its recipe that they want you to use. Uh, and a lot of them I do not care for whatsoever. So I really like UNHs. Um, so they've, they've done a lot of great work uh, and they've been doing this, you know, doing it for a long time. So, and a bunch of their stuff is available online and I've listened to a number of their speakers. So it's just, it's wonderful that they've, that they've thought about it. You know, my biggest thing with this is thinking about it and practicing with it um, is one thing. It's, I, I would really, my goal is to get people to start implementing it because that's really, that's really the, the phase that we're at. Okay. Um, and then we've got a comment here um, that the Mashantucket Pequot Museum has an award-winning green roof system over two lower level floors of the museum. Um, and I guess their out winter hours are 10 to five. So if people wanna go up and have a look at that, um, that's a local resource or an example we can point to. Um, there's one more permeable pavement question here. Oh no, we did answer that. That was about the ledge question. Okay, and Francis, yeah, confirm the UNH. We'll try to find that UNH website and send it out uh, following the meeting um, in my follow-up email. Okay, there is a new green roof question and it's actually whether or not green roofs can be used for growing vegetables, which may be an incentive, um, particularly in urban areas or in residential areas, if they could double as community gardens. Absolutely. So Green City Grows and um, Recover Green Roofs worked together and they built a rooftop farm at Fenway Park. Uh, the thing with uh, green roofs and vegetables uh, is, I guess it all depends on, on how you're doing it. Creating like an in-ground veggie plot might be hard um, because green roof media drains very fast. So that's, there wouldn't always be so much moisture in there. You could definitely grow a, a pretty cool herb garden uh, in just all of that. Um, so yes, it can be done. Yes, it should be thought about. Um, and I think especially in urban, urban areas, finding more ways and more places uh, that we can uh, increase food production is, is certainly huge. One of the other things that that made me think of um, is people often ask me, can you use rain barrel or rainwater harvesting systems for your vegetables? I would suggest not because of the leaching and you don't really know what's coming off of your roof. You don't really know the state of your shingles, et cetera, et cetera. So unless you have a metal or slate roof, I do not suggest you using that water on vegetable for, for, for vegetable production. Uh, definitely for landscape uh, needs, absolutely. And like I said, for like washing your car and the like, certainly for that, um, simply because we, we cannot always be sure what kind of chemicals leach into that water uh, from our shingles, especially like on a hot day, you know, when they, when the temperature and they get really warm and then we get that rainstorm, you know, it's, it's, it's just a cautionary thing. That's a good point. I think that's the last question, excuse me, we have in the chat. So um, if people still are interested in continuing this discussion, I'll invite you, if you have a question and you wanna unmute yourself to ask, um, please go ahead. Boy. All right. I know you've covered that's a lot awesome. of ground. I guess you, you've answered everybody's questions. Well, that's perfect. And these were great <laughs> questions. These were, these were absolutely great questions. I'm hoping that, you know, everybody feels like they actually ha they have somewhat of an understanding. You know, if you are looking for a professional to hire for a permeable pavement installation, or, you know, or the like, I hope you feel like you have a little background and some understanding. So when they show up with a truck full of sand, you can just send them off the other way. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and you know, and the like. And um, I would love to come back and and speak with you on a different topic or any other time. So thank you so much for having me. Well, you're welcome, Trevor. And would it be okay if we um, share your email with our audience? And if anybody has questions, they can get in touch with you. Absolutely. There's always follow up questions, and I like to make myself as available as possible. So yes, certainly, please do. I um, put out a, my email and my Instagram and everything with my phone number. So I don't know if everybody saw that, but that was yeah. up. 
Okay. And I assume that's on your Re-Earth Boston website too. So correct, I can correct. see people you can always there. get me. Yep. yep. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Trevor. That's been, this has been a terrific program and uh, we really appreciate your joining us and we'd love to have you back sometime. And this I'd certainly like, love to have you come down and give me some tips <laughs> on my property. Certainly we will plan on it and make it happen. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And um, there will be a follow-up email and hopefully I'll get this recording uh, posted to our YouTube channel. So if anybody wants to rewatch some of it or share it with a friend, uh, they'll be able to do so. Thanks again.